Well, hi, everybody. It's Lee Baudet, your host of Sport Car USA and also the podcast Test Drive. We also do a video on YouTube called Test Drive, but this is the Test Drive podcast. We welcome you back. And I was thinking today we would be talking about the Chevrolet Corvette. Even some people don't call it a Chevrolet. It's pretty much just a Corvette. That's the way I look at it most times. But uh, we thought it'd be interesting to go through the Corvette history. With me is Scott Nickerson. Scott represents Sport Car USA as well. Scott, welcome back. Good to be back. So the Corvette, as you know, I love Corvettes. And really, it was a love that began not that many years ago. I was never really into the old ones because I knew I could never afford one. I did end up getting a C7, a yellow one, beautiful, absolutely loved that car. And today I have the C8, which of course is the mid-engine. Yeah, used to be a Ford guy, right? Absolutely, yeah, 100%. Yeah. My dad was a Ford Mercury guy, so. Well, we're going to have to do uh, something <laughs> on some Shelbys or something next so that you can... Yeah. Stay true to that. <laughs> or maybe a Mercury Monterey. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a sexy car for you right there. <laughs> so the Corvette, as you know, is an early, an early American sports car. And back in the 1950s, General Motors, that was the largest car company in the country at the time. Of course, GM sold a lot of different cars. Seems like they were missing something. There wasn't any American car manufacturers venturing into sports or performance cars at the time. The performance car market was dominated by European manufacturers who raced on road racing circuits after World War II, before my time. Not much. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty close there. I really am. Companies like Porsche. Load, notice I said Porsche, not mm. Porsche. It's Porsche. It is. Even though <laughs> 90% of people call it a Porsche. Lotus and Jaguar, those are some of the cars. They were dominating the performance market, the car market, that is. And GM was such a big force in automotive, they decided it was time to get in on the action. A guy by the name of Harley Earl was a designer for GM in the 50s, and he was driving, he was a driving force behind GM deciding to make a sports car. I think they made a pretty good choice. Project Opal. Have you ever heard of that? Mm. It started as a secret project for GM's new sports car. Now, this Harley guy, he first offered Project Opal to Chevy's GM, Ed Cole. The project was to produce a very interesting concept vehicle that Harley wanted to debut at the 53 New York Auto Show. Before it could even get there, Ed Cole knew that it needed to go into production. And he knew that they had something very special on their hands with this project. The car was almost immediately offered to the public in 1953, as the brand new Chevrolet Corvette. It's kind of interesting how fast that stuff develops. They go from no sports cars to they're like, all right, we're going to do it. And then it's immediately like, you know, it ends up being one of the most iconic sports cars. Yeah. I mean, they definitely hit a home run with this car. I'd love to have a 53 Corvette right now, right? Whoa. Yeah. They're definitely, uh, they're definitely not as exciting as the newer Corvettes, but you know, as a collector's piece, they're definitely. Yeah. And as we go along here, you're going to, be amazed at how the mid-engine Corvette came about because mm -hmm. really it was thought of many, 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 many they, decades ago. They wanted to do it, yeah, a long time ago. So there's this Western European-born man working for GM. His name was, excuse me for the pronunciation, Zora Arcus Duntoff. Did I get that? That sounds, that sounds right. That, that sounds very official, doesn't it? <laughs> and he first saw the Corvette concept at the 53 Auto Show that we just mentioned. He was in love with it right from the start, and he knew at that moment that he needed to get s involved in some part of this car's legacy because he was already working for GM. He worked his way up, and eventually he would be directly involved in the Corvette production and design. And he would, uh, you know, no spoilers, but he would be going to be pretty instrumental in the Corvette even now. Well, like you said just a few minutes ago, the Corvette was a, it, it was something that was completely from the ground up build mm -hmm. for Chevy. The first Corvette was uh, was to piece together using existing Chevy parts from other GM vehicles, so they're kind of piecemealing it, it seems. And GM, they didn't even design a new engine platform for this performance vehicle. They used the Blue Flame inline six-cylinder engine. Yeah, six-cylinder for a Corvette. I know. Not many people know that. Chevy's first performance car was a V6. I just can't believe that, but it's true. The engine was tinkered with, and 
They tuned it up to about 150 horsepower. Whoa. And by, yeah, whoa. By today's standard, that's almost laughable, isn't it? Yeah. This vehicle, it wasn't fast, obviously, but most modern economy sedans would probably dust it. Yeah, you take, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd take a Prius on a drag strip against this thing. Oh, boy. Yeah, look out. The new concept vehicle took flight uh, with a strong and light full fiberglass body. It's like such an interesting concept looking at cars then versus now, like just entirely a big fiberglass mold. Yeah, and I think anybody that knows a little about a Corvette, they know that fiberglass is part of its makeup. Mm -hmm. So, but you know what? The first Corvette, it wasn't the success GM was hoping for. Must have had too much horsepower. Yeah, it, 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 it had a great look and seemed fun compared to the other cars GM was producing. Mm-hmm. So it definitely looked fun. But the original Corvette, it really didn't handle well. Uh, we talked about the power. is definitely underpowered. And the original Corvette was also only available in a convertible. Now, I kind of like that. I mean, See, this is I'm, a two-seater, right? I'm probably in the minority here, but I don't really care for most cars in convertibles. I like their coupe versions better. You can always put the top up. Yeah. <laughs> Just like that. So they were working on naming this car. And they knew it had to be something that would fit, you know, fast and light. The whole concept, fast and light. So what they did was they ended up using the name Corvette as a tribute to the speedy and lightweight naval ships of the time. The Corvette naval ships, these were the smallest class of vessel to still be considered a warship. It's kind of interesting that a lot of these cars, um, a lot of their names come from military Things like we talked, yeah. um, I, think, I believe it's the Charger. Uh, we did a test drive episode on that where it's the Charger uh, Hellcat. The, the Hellcat name comes from one of their one of their planes. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't believe Mustang comes from that, but there is another uh, military fighter plane that's a Mustang. Yeah, I think so. my dad worked on Mustang, absolutely, because yeah. he was in the, uh, the Air Force and the National Guard for, my goodness, 40, 50 years. So the Corvette... The, going back to the name of the Corvette, it was used as a fast attack ship and missile boat, okay? So that's how they came up with using the Corvette as the name. I would say it's safe to say that the modern version of a Chevy Corvette is a missile in its own right. I mean, you can attest to that. You've, you've got one of your own, so. Yeah, yeah. They're, I, they're speedy. I think that would be a good vanity plate now that I'm thinking about it. Missile. missile. Oh, I like it. You could do ones for the I's. Yeah, yeah. Or the or the L's. Yeah, we're in Vermont, so you could only have two, two numbers that you can pick out, and it can't be a zero because that looks like an O. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's if you're thinking about a vanity plate. The so. three could be the E. There's there's options. Oh, we we've got options all right. Well, I, what have you had in the in the past for vanity plates? I've had, I mentioned before, loud L O U D. I've had. I'm surprised like, that wasn't taken. I know. I know. 99 Stang for a Mustang. That's good. Cruisin'. Hmm. C-R-U-Z-I-N, I believe. Uh, we'll have to do a podcast on vanity plates. Not just my vanity plates, but if you have a really cool vanity plate, let us know what it is. We'll do a podcast on vanity plates. I think that'll be fun. Yeah. So getting back to the Chevy Corvette, seems like they needed to do something to shake things up and cement the Corvette as a real competitor to other brands like Ferrari and Lamborghini. Seems like they had a long way to go. They realized finally that the V6 V6 engine just wasn't cutting it anymore. And then a 55 Chevy finally put out a V8 in the Corvette. Finally. Finally. This new V8 gave the car a much meaner sound and a whopping 195 horsepower. Chevy was on the right path at this time. The Corvette, they just had to keep improving on the solid base of it. So the following year, they saw a removable hardtop added to the Corvette. So Scott's happy about (laughs) that. This was in 1954, I believe, since that would be following the 53. Is that correct, Scott? Oh, the the 55, it was 55, the V8, so yeah, 56. Oh, 56. Well, I'm a couple years behind. Time traveling. Yeah, I would say so. Time (laughs) time flies by on this podcast. (laughs) So that very same year, they also gave us the first Corvette on the racing scene. Corvette, well known on the racing scene. And it really performed great. It gave drivers a great chance at winning, which is what it's all about when you're on the course, on the racetrack. 
All these things finally vaulted Chevy to sell the Corvette and win America's heart. Remember the heartbeat? Mm. There you go. The Generation 2 Corvette, they call it the C2. Here's where the C's come in. Came out in 1963. So they threw around a few concepts that didn't take off, but before they came up with the final C2 design, two of the concepts that Chevy tried out before landing on the C2 design were the 59 Stingray Concept Racer and the 1961 Mako Shark, M-A-K-O. I like, <clears throat> I saw some pictures of that one. Um, it's a super cool design. Uh, it's it's very, I mean, it's a Mako Shark, so when they have it in blue, mm -hmm. the, the blue color of the, the car, they've got it, it looks like a shark on the side, like the side profile. They should have named this car the Chevy Shark, <laughs> oh. right? <laughs> I like the Corvette name. I really do. So the final C2 Corvettes, they were better engineered. They were designed from the original models. And the drivability of the car got better. And they had a little more horsepower from that 165 to 195 than the previous generation. So they were gaining, as they say. Baby steps. Baby, baby, baby steps. Now here's a guy for you. Zora Arcus Duntoff. He's back. Yes. He was involved heavily in this generation of Corvette. This guy had a major contribution to the Corvette during these times that many people view him as the father of the Corvette. Zora was a big advocate for making the Corvette a mid-engine. So here we go. We're going back to the concept of the mid-engine way back in the 60s, early 60s. And uh, he wanted it to be a bit like its European competition, at least so. It would have the same standards. Mm -hmm. They placed the engine farther back. Some people would say further, farther back, <laughs> which would make it better uh, for the weight distribution and, of course, the handling. So nobody else at GM was on board with the concept of a mid-engine Corvette yet. That's why we didn't see a mid-engine Corvette until 2020. They made some concepts of it, and it was super cool. It was yeah, and held the road very nicely. But yeah. Mid-engine just wasn't on the drawing board back then. Mm -hmm. Can, couldn't convince anybody to, to go for it. Very few American cars were mid-engine at the time, and GM just wasn't ready to take that leap yet. Even without getting his way, we're talking about Duntoff again, on the mid-engine Corvette, Duntoff was able to craft a Corvette that put out over 300 horsepower. Now, again, we're, we're going from 195, really 165 was it, and then 195, now 300 horsepower. And they put it inside a super light fiberglass body. There's your fiberglass body again. Finally, the Corvette was sporty and fun to drive. Most people agree to that. Yep. Yeah, I was, I was, I was reading some things that were saying that in order to make, with the current body of the Corvette in that generation, if they wanted to make it mid-engine, they'd have to sacrifice, I think, going back to a V6 uh, or downsizing the engine and stuff like that. And they, that was just not worth the sacrifice of potentially being underpowered in right. order to handle well. and Yeah, and the bottom so line is... Been? Yeah, the bottom line is how is this new puppy going to sell? Yeah, that'd be a, a big thing. Like, no one, no American manufacturers are really doing a lot of mid-engine. Yeah. The Corvette was a pricey model and a two-seater. It's not going to appeal to everybody. Right. But they did very well. In 1963, selling this vehicle, they sold 50% more than the previous models. And any idea what the total would be, Scott? Yeah, they sold over 20,000. Whoa. Yeah, that's, is, that's really good. Yeah, especially for then. 63 was the first year that it would offer the Z06 package. Corvette's known to have a number of packages, and I would say one of the more popular ones, even in today's model, would be the Z06. Yeah, still they still have a Z06 model for the, the current generation. They really do. It's been around for a long time. Zora was an advocate for providing a package on the car that made it race ready. Uh, remember, this car started out as a race car, pretty much. He is a major advocate to the uh, Corvette being used to race. And the package name was inspired by him as well. So there you go. The special racing package, they ended up calling it the Zorro Option 6. There you go with your Z06. Yep. I never knew that. Zorro. If you went to a car show today, yeah, I've got the Zorro Option 6. 
they look at you like probably you have two heads, hmm. or they'd be very knowledgeable because they have a 1963 Corvette. Yep. And they would say, oh, I know what that is. Sure. I've got a Z06. Hmm. Five years later, the C3 launched in 1968, and it had an all-new shape. Only a few minor changes between the C3 and the C2 Corvette. Now, i got to tell you, I wasn't a Corvette person, but I never knew what C2 meant, what C6 meant, what C7 meant until the last decade or so. I just never paid attention. Mm -hmm. You know, what are they talking about, C3 and C2? So I think that's a, that's a great idea to label your cars like that. Yep. Helps you know what generations they are. Exactly. Like. Exactly. And usually it seems like it's a 10 year generation span between each C model, but at least it uh, has been that way uh, the last few decades. Let's get back to that 1968 shape. Again, it's an all new shape. The exterior door handles were changed. They put a new grill on it and a few other small cosmetic changes as well. And then back in 69, that was the only year that the ZL1 option was offered with a big block 7-liter aluminum engine. So is the Z, we're still talking about Zora? I, I can't confirm that, but it would make sense that that's also Zora. Yeah. Um, the ZL1, they have that in Camaros a lot now. Yeah. They use that for Camaros, and I'm not 100% sure if they use it on Corvettes. But, um, yeah, the ZL1 is another one of their performance packages nowadays. Learning a lot about Zs here on this podcast <laughs> today. This engine was massive. Again, it was a 7-liter aluminum engine, so it makes it light, too. Mm -hmm. And it produced 430 horsepower. It's a pretty, percentage-wise, it's a pretty big upgrade from that's 300. A, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. That's a big gap right there. 33% increase or whatever. Big gap in a positive way. Mm. C3, that was the best-selling Corvette of all time at the time. And you mentioned that 20,000 they sold mm. with the C2. Yep. This one was up to 30,000 the first year alone. That's a pretty big leap. I would say so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would say so. So the Generation 3 Corvette would run until about 1982, and there were just a few design changes over the years. C4 would be released in 84, and that had a completely new design. Now, there were rumors that. It would get a mid-engine. Here we go, mid-engine. That's what Zora wanted. Unfortunately, the only way to fit the engine behind the driver would be to revert back to a V6, and Chevy said, no thanks. Yeah, <laughs> We've got the V8. We're pretty happy with that V8. Yeah, it was putting out a lot of power, so I'm sure sports car fans would be like, hey, how do you like this? The engine's yeah. now smaller. And this was talking about the new C4 that was coming up, so... Uh, they, they said, no, we, we're going to stay with the V8, and we'll just table that mid-engine until 2020. Yeah. They didn't say that at the time, but in the back of somebody's mind, <laughs> Zora would we, be proud. we're not going to give up. Yeah, Zora would be very happy, that's for sure. Well, Chevy was starting to lose ground to the European competitors like Lamborghini and Ferrari, and it bothered them. And in 1990, they released the C4 Corvette ZR1. Now, the ZR1... It had the new LT5 engine. That's a 5.7 liter V8, and it produced 375 for horsepower. The LT5, that was built with help from fellow sports car company, the sport car company called Lotus. You've heard of that. And now this was the fastest Corvette in production with 172 miles per hour. That's the top speed. That's pretty good for 1990, I would say. Yeah, I think my 2020 is... 190. Yep. And those are probably electronically limited too. Right. Whereas these, they probably had a lot less electronic limitations going on. That was probably just the engine flat out. No question about it. I mean, my Corvette, my 20, it's, I don't consider it real fast. I mean, yeah, 192 is pretty good, but it's the one of the quickest cars mm -hmm. on the road today. Yeah. Zero to 60 in 2.8 seconds. So I, I, I'm not a guy that likes going 150. I like getting there and then backing off. Yeah, it's but the accelerating that's it's fun. Accelerating, that's, that's definitely the I mean, most fun for me. If you're just like cruising at one speed, then it's not as exciting as changing speeds and cornering, and that's where the fun yeah, is. Yeah, and then, you know, when you're going 150, 190, you're waiting for the deer to jump out in front of you. Right, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good time for anybody it involved. It really is not a good time at all. 
It's like Randy or, you know, Johnson. The, yeah. the, the felony level yeah. speeding ticket that you'd receive. Yeah, I'm going to bring up a Randy Johnson. Randy Johnson, a left handed pitcher. Oh, for, yeah. Remember that? He hit the seagull. Hit the bird. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, uh, humane society people, but <laughs> yeah, he imploded on that bird. Oh, my goodness. And he throws really hard. Right. He's not throwing at 192 miles an hour, but, you know. Right. Yeah. The same concept. Yeah. <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll get off of that subject now before we get in trouble. Back in 1997. Chevy released the C5, so we're getting there. That was a complete redesign as well, with almost nothing borrowed from the previous generation. Now, that's the largest update and change in the car's history in 1997. No stone was left unturned. They did the complete redesign. What's nice is the car did improve on its handling, its weight distribution, and it had more power on the base models. Not everybody can afford all the, the whistles and bells. Chevy, they brought back the Z06 package in that year, and the Z06 name and badge came from the original Stingray model that we've talked about, and that gave the racing feel to the all-new C5 Corvette. I think, I want to say it was either the C5 or C6 where I had, uh, it may have been the C6 where I had a, a Fastest Cars book where... I got it when I was a kid, and it was like the Lamborghini Murcielago was in there, hmm. or like all these older sports, I mean, older now, sports cars. And I think that's where I fell in love with the Corvette was the five or six generation where they were one of the like fastest. That was when you were playing with your Hot Wheels? Yeah, I had, a, and I got like a book from a book fair or something, yeah. like a Scholastic book fair. Gee and, yeah. I was playing with my Hot Wheels just last night, and I, I didn't have any Corvettes on no? the floor. No, no. It's unfortunate. So you mentioned the C6. <laughs> And that was released in 2006. Mm -hmm. What happened with that car? Well, let me tell you what happened. It further improved its performance. It had a 6-liter V8 with 400 horsepower in the base model. And the C6, it was similar in a lot of ways to the C5 outside of some minor styling changes. I mean, any, any new car you buy, they do make very subtle changes. Yeah, instead the, of changing the entire car. The 5 and 6 look pretty similar. Yeah. As far as generationally, the, those two are pretty close. So in the following year, it featured a small block V8 engine, and that was capable of producing 505 horsepower. So we keep going up and up mm -hmm. and up. Back in 2009, the ZR1 made its triumphant return. And this had a 6.2 liter supercharged V8 capable of 638 horsepower as well as some aero handling and cosmetic improvements. C5 ran until about 2013, and it would take a massive leap in performance into the next generation. Yeah, when they started supercharging those engines, um, I've seen some people, some videos of people with also modified past stock C6s, and they're ridiculous. The 2014 C7, which is the one I had, it was yellow. Oh, my goodness, I love that car. I just Canary? love the redesign. Was it canary yellow? Is that Can what the yes. color was? That's yes. the That's the in the book that I was talking about. There was a canary yellow one. I'm like, I want a canary yellow Corvette. Yeah, it was gorgeous. I mean, everywhere I went, people were just gawking at it. It, it was so much fun to drive as well. It had, a, that, of course, the all-new face and a brand-new engine. The base model had 465 horsepower. That's what I had. And it had a blistering 0 to 60 in 3.9 seconds. And that was fast as many of the other European performance cars at the time. So they brought the supercharged Z06 back again. And this produced 660 horsepower. The C7 Corvette started with that new look and body shape. And a lot of people started to look more like supercar brands. They started to think that as well. Yeah, a um, lot more European Yeah, silence. yeah. The Z06 C7 Corvette, I mean, that wasn't a joke. That thing, like, flew around the track, and the acceleration was really extreme. Mm -hmm. They took everything with the C7 and made it a true track car. Yeah, we, we have, I believe, just one Z06 C7 Corvette here at Sport Car USA. Uh, it's got, like, these American flag or, like, a red, white, and blue patriotic stripes yeah, up it. Yeah, that's good looking. It's got the blue Laguna interior. Oh, it's it's beautiful. And I've I've gotten to drive it. I only could drive it at, like, you know, 35 <laughs> miles an hour on the <laughs> yeah, road. But right. you can feel that it, it wants to just go. And I, th I know I've told this story before, but when I had my C7, I went to a car show, 
it was a car show that all cars were allowed to participate and to, you know, get in there and show your car off. So I ended up winning the best of show, and I felt guilty because most of the cars at this car show were <laughs> – antiques and or classic cars stuff people were like rebuilding or so i would go up to get my award and i'm, I'm kind of hearing like grumbling i can't believe that guy's here or how how could they give that it's a brand new car so i, I got in my car <laughs> all and you I, did was go buy it you know? i know i know that's all i did i did nothing too and i won the top award i decided i'm going to get on this car as i leave this car show right so uh, i start to get on it and corvette put the traction control button right by your elbow which oh is, yeah, it's in that little like yeah. dial. It's like in the yeah middle of that near dial. the, the yeah. not the glove box, but the center console. Yep. I accidentally hit it with my elbow, not knowing it, mm -hmm. and I got on that car, and the ass end almost came around to the front end. It scared the heck out of me. Never did that again. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you never want to take that traction control off unless you're on the track. Yeah, I mean that's I mean that's what it's for. Yeah. I mean, my brand new trophy almost went out the window. <laughs> the one that you didn't deserve. Apparently. The, the absolutely did not deserve that. I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> so the father of the Corvette, Zora, we're back to him. He unfortunately passed away in 1996, had a good run, and he did get his wish with the mid-engine. Finally came true in 2020. And of course, that is the C8, which I'm so happy to have. I was one of the first ones in New England to get one. Just, just got lucky. It was some guy wanted the C8, and it's a coupe. He decided, oh, I want a, a convertible. Mm. So this one became available. I only paid $1,000 over sticker. That's pretty good, considering what they yeah. were at at some point. Right now, in 2023, they're going for 15 20 Right, and sticker. even a year ago, it was like 40 Absolutely. Over so I got, a, I got a really good deal there. But uh, I, the guy waited for a convertible. He finally got his convertible about a year later. Wow. I don't see the big difference. My roof comes off. To me, right. that's a convertible. Yeah. I, see, I don't mind those kind of convertibles. Right. It's like a hard top, removable hard top. And it's very easy to, to take off. But I'm perfectly happy. I feel like I'm in a convertible, and I like the looks of the coupe a little mm -hmm. better than the convertible. So that worked out well for me. I would say, though, without Zora Arcus Duntoff, the mid-engine Corvette probably never would have happened. Yeah. We've, you know, we've talked about the history, and this goes way back into the 50s where he was talking about a mid-engine. People were kind of like laughing at him. Right. They aren't laughing anymore. I know a lot of Corvette enthusiasts don't care for the new design. I really didn't care for the new design when I saw it in a magazine, a couple of magazines. And they're like, oh, wow, huh. And then I went and saw it in person. It's like, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Well, a lot of people are like, that's not a Corvette. Right. Because it looks nothing like. But I'm like, at, at what point does the car, like if you look at a, the C1 versus a C3, those are very different. Right. Three to five, you know, there's there's going to be big differences. But I think it's because it looks a lot like Lamborghinis and things yeah. like that, that people, like it doesn't look like it's an American muscle car. Correct. And I think that's where people get upset about it. But I, I love the look of the C8. I, think I it's love the it. best looking Corvette. I love it. But I totally get why certain Corvette owners oh, yeah. and, and lovers. Purists. Purists. They just, yeah. they shake their head. Like, that's not a Corvette. I'm happy with it. I know that. But I do get a lot of people that say, that is, looks just like a Maserati or a Lamborghini. So. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, the stuff they're doing now too with their um, they're kind of next, it's not a new generation, but they're kind of their next step with the Corvette in making it a hybrid vehicle, uh, I think is super interesting. I think there's a lot of people that are going to, again, purists that aren't going to want just the word hybrid turns some people yeah. off to sports cars. Um, but it's going to, it's got the all wheel drive design uh, where it's got the front wheels are powered by the electric motors, which I think is a super interesting thing. They, they released a trailer where it was just, uh, they released a trailer where it was driving in the snow, and they were, like, hammering on it and drifting through the snow and all this stuff. I'm like, oh. We, we live in Vermont, and there's a doctor that lives around here, and he drives yeah. his Corvette in the winter. And my It's heart, not all-wheel drive, though. No, it's not all-wheel drive. No. My heart's, like, going down to my stomach. Like, oh, please, don't do that to this car. Please, please, please. But we never thought we'd see the Corvette look like it does today, and we never thought we would see an all-wheel drive version of the Corvette, which you just yep. talked about, the C8 E-Ray. Yep. And that's the hybrid Corvette that's becoming sooner than later. 
yeah, I think uh, I want to say that they're starting production. And you said that your Corvette is very quick. Yes. Uh, this one's even quicker. Amazing. Um, I think they shaved like three tenths of a second off. You said yours was two eight, two nine. Two, two eight. Yeah. I think this one's two five, two four, I something it. around that. It's mid twos, which is ridiculous. Yeah. There's this commercial out that's right now, and this guy's driving the E Ray really fast, like on the track. And this kid comes up to him and says, "Hey, that's a really nice car. What do you do for a living?" And the guy driving says, I'm the president of General Motors. Oh. <laughs> you want to go for a ride, kid? Kid says, well, yeah. And the rest, oh, it was a great commercial. Great commercial by Chevrolet. I think it's super interesting that Chevy chose to go hybrid with the Corvette. And the way they did it is smart. They basically kept the big V8 engine. They didn't like downsize like yep. a EcoBoost. They didn't do like a V6 turbo setup like Mustang did. Yeah. They kept it hybrid. They just added battery power to the front wheels so they're not taking anything away mm -hmm. they're just adding additional and it's kind of there's like a cool driving mode with it too where it's uh i can't stealth mode yeah yeah so it'll it'll shut the engine off and under certain speeds for x amount of miles you can drive front wheel drive so if you're going through your residential neighborhood late at night or whatever early in the morning right you can drive with just the electric motors probably in the front. should probably should nah <laughs> that's no fun <laughs> i love that word stealth yeah. Stealth, you know, F-35 fighters and mm -hmm. stealth this and stealth that. That's, that's they pull maybe, a lot from yeah. military and fighter planes. Yeah. yeah Not that it. the word stealth is exclusive to that. I but think there's a vanity plate in my future. Mm, there you go. Missile. So the Corvette, it's been around for a long time, and they just keep pushing the limits of design and performance. I don't see that changing anytime soon. I, I love mine, and I love the two Corvettes that I've owned. So, Scott, you got to get yourself one. Yeah, hopefully someday in the future. Yeah. Canary yellow. I don't know if they come in canary anymore, but I want that yellow still. Well, we can always paint it. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Maybe the C9 will be a complete EV. So that's going to wrap up another edition of our podcast here, Test Drive. I want to mention that Sport Car USA buys and sells sport cars all over the country. So you can get a hold of uh, the gentlemen and ladies at sportcarusa.com to check out the inventory and maybe pick yourself up a really, really nice sport car. Scott, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Lee. We'll see everybody next week on another edition of our Test Drive podcast. And remember, let's never forget the men and women serving this great country of ours. Goodbye, everybody.